And we are now live. Tina Greenbaum, thank you so much for joining me on uh, Speakers Who Get Results, actually Strategic Speaking for Results. We're starting this on Facebook. We will be doing this, uh, probably do this later as a podcast. So thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Happy to be here with you as always. <laughs> okay. I am so happy to have Tina Greenbaum back because when I started the podcast, Speakers Who Get Results, Tina was one of the first people I called. I mean, we've been colleagues for some time and she's one of, she's the one person I call up and say, Tina, can you talk to me about such and such and such? And we have spoken at the same places and, and so forth. So uh, I'm just really delighted to have you here. Let me give a little bit of the official bio, which is yeah. Tina Greenbaum works with executives who want to increase their performance level in high stakes, high pressure situations. An optimal performance specialist and sports psychology consultant, Tina's signature program, Mastery Under Pressure, empowers leaders and their teams using cutting edge technology, neuroscience, energy psychology, sports psychology, and current learning theory. In addition to her Mastery Under Pressure team program, Tina also works with CEOs and senior level management as a confidential Thera coach on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Her expertise in guiding executives through their psychological and personal issues helps her clients cope with the demands that their personal struggles place on them as they strive to be atop their sec sector. As she likes to say, the only thing standing between you and your goals is you. So Tina, thank you for joining me today. Yes. Great. I wanted to talk to you. Uh, this is also, I've got the, the background for my podcast, Speakers Who Get Results, because tomorrow I've got a podcast episode talking about burnout, setting boundaries, and uh, to combat burnout with Michael Levitt, the wonderful Michael Levitt. But I wanted to talk a little more with you about stress and the psychology of it and how we manage stress. And I, I want to start with, you have a great phrase. It's something about stress being the perceived difference. Yes. Okay. Please take it away, Tina. <laughs> so when we think about stress, we're always thinking about the perceived amount of control that we think we have or we don't have. So the operative word is perceived. And since we're in the time of the coronavirus, okay, and the stress level is very high, if we look at it through this definition, it's really because we perceive that we have very little control over what is going on. Mm -hmm. And so the operative word always, when people ask me if there's like one thing that you can share with us and you wanna take away um, in managing stress, it's always I look at what's in my control, what's out of my control. Okay, so if I cannot control what's happening on the meta level, you know, our government and the, the world, well, can I control my environment? Can I, con you know, what can I control? Can I control my thoughts? Can I control me? And it always comes down to starting with I. Uh -huh. The way that I can find some sense of control in my situation. You know, that's, that's so helpful. I, I think about a friend, I, I called up one morning and I said, how are you? She said, oh, I've been awake since 3.30 in the morning because I was lying there thinking about the world and politics and the virus and all these horrible things. And I finally just gave up and got up at four because I, I was not going to sleep anymore. And, and I said, so don't read Twitter in the middle of the night. But uh, <laughs> true. true. But let's talk about burnout and stress. And where where does that? I mean, burnout tends to come from stress. Yes. But how do you define burnout? Well, I think I look at it this way. So if you imagine, somebody may be listening, but if you're watching, okay, my hands are maybe about parallel to each other and about four inches apart. So I call this 
actually there's a there's a therapeutic term now for it i've called it always a buffer but your window of tolerance for stress so let's say that stress comes along okay it hits me in this window and i my nervous system and my psyche has the tolerance for what's coming in as soon as my nervous system gets overloaded i'm now out of that zone and here comes the stress response and the stress response is there is hormones, adrenaline, cortisol running through the system, running through your brain, running through your whole body, getting you ready for fight, flight, or freeze. Those are the stress responses that that we have, you know, that that our our organism has for us when we're under a tremendous amount of stress. And so what happens when that happens? You know, we, we can't think clearly that, that the heart starts to race. The, somebody said to me yesterday, as I was explaining, she says, yeah, is that when my hands begin to tingle? Yes, because all the blood is rushing to the heart. It's rushing away from the extremities and getting us to ready to be able to run. Wow, okay. Okay, so when we're under chronic stress, which is where burnout comes from, Okay, because this is, a, this is a normal response, right? So something scares us, the body goes into the stress response. But if you are an animal in the, in, in the wild, animals go through that stress response, but as soon as the danger is over, it goes back to the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the one that says, you know, I got money in the bank, everything is fine. And so we as humans, we don't necessarily, are, we're not quite as able to get ourselves back beyond the stress level, back into that parasympathetic nervous system. So we end up in a state of chronic stress. And that's mm -hmm. where we're in trouble. That's where yeah. we get you know, kind of fatigued and, um, and then we really can't really think really clearly. We're short with other people, we're irritable, and we have very little, that, that tolerance level goes down to, really kind of a minimal amount. And that's where ulcers come from. That's and that's where, all, yeah. All stress related diseases. I, I think there's some kind of statistics about 90% of the illnesses that we have are stress related diseases. So stress hits it, then it begins to start to knock down our immune system and wherever mm -hmm. our vulnerabilities are, it could be in our, you know, a bad back that goes out under high stress. It could, you know, I had breast cancer for many years of stress. Um, it, it could be heart disease, diabetes, you know, eating disorders, addiction, all kinds of things of the way that we're, we have that propensity towards our vulnerabilities. Okay, so how it seems to me that setting boundaries so that you can take care of yourself and you know, everybody says self-care 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 but how and how can you do it in a safe way uh, you know i have i work with a lot of executive uh, executives and you know helping them with their presentation skills and so forth and quite often the presentation skills are so that these uh, high level women get listened to and that reduces the stress and the frustration of not being heard. Mm -hmm. But sometimes I'll have a, a session with a client and she'll say, I can't, I can't deal with it right now. I'm so stressed. I can't think, I haven't been able to think about what we were, what I was going to do with you. I'm just up, you know, over my head. Yes. Especially now working from home especially if there are kids yes. and you have to take care of kids uh, or if you are spending 30% of your time trying to keep your team together and yet you're still expected to deliver the results of 80 hour weeks. Yes. So you're talking about things that again, in normal circumstances, mm -hmm. you know, not normal circumstances right now, so this level of stress and stress in intolerance is a normal response to an abnormal situation. Ah, oh, good point. So number one, we have to kind of recognize what, what's being asked of us. Let's be real, you know, because when our expectations 
are in one place and the reality is in another place, we have nothing but frustration and disappointment in between. Mm -hmm. So I use the example, you know, right before COVID hit, I was uh, planning a wedding party for my, my son and daughter-in-law. Luckily it wasn't their wedding, but it was a wedding celebration where my family was coming from all over the country. And so as you know, the, the, you know, the COVID started to kind of show its place and I'm thinking like, my son said to me, mom, you know, this is a real thing. Yeah. <laughs> and it might be something that you have to cancel this party. So in the beginning, it was like, you've got to be kidding. That's, but as it kind of got worse, but what I recognized I was under a tremendous amount of anxiety. I was so anxious about this party, about this decision that, you know, people were flying in from all over the place. And then, you know, the bride and groom were coming from Hawaii. And, and then this one, my nephew says, well, I'm coming anyway, Antina, you know, and, and so, but the fact that I could recognize how anxious I was, then maybe put me back into that question, what's in my control, what's out of my control. Ah, yes, great. So it became a unilateral decision, the party is off. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. I couldn't tolerate that level of stress and uncertainty. Mm -hmm. Again, the idea about anxiety is that when we have a lot of structure, our anxiety level goes down. Uh, right, exactly. When we have a lot of uncertainty, our anxiety level goes up. We are living in an uncertain time. So we're being required to be able to tolerate uncertainty. Mm -hmm. That's number one. And those of us that like to, you know, have everything sort of in its place and have a lot of control and plan, and this is a time that's blowing that up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Right? Yeah. So yeah. I always kind of comfort, you know, it is until it's not. We're in ah. the situation until we're not. Good point. Okay. That's bringing it back to reality. Okay, this is the reality. My kids are home. You know, the school is not, is, is not coming back. I've got a job. I've got t a team. I've got people with, with putting a lot of pressure on me. I've got all these things. That's my reality. Okay. What's in my control? Mm -hmm. Okay. What's in my control? Well, what can I start with, with my children? Because they're the ones that are the most disruptive and they're the ones that need the most structure. What can I do? So I was just talking, and I've heard it a couple of times from different clients and different people. Um, they're starting to talk about pods of, of, you know, for those people that can, that are able financially to hire somebody to work with a group of kids at a time and then moving from one house to the next. Mm -hmm. so again, this doesn't speak to the people who cannot afford that. Right. So then we come down to, so what can I do? Mm -hmm. And you're constantly asking yourself, well, I might have to say to my boss, I cannot right. manage all of this. You know, I, I need to get, I need to get help. I need to work less hours. Mm -hmm. I need, to, and that's where the boundaries kind of come in. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay, then we, we, you and I talked about, I had a client and I have a client who cannot quit her job. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And actually, I'd like to tell a story before you tell that story, because uh, I have a client who is, uh, she's, she's wonderful. She's very highly placed in her company. Mm -hmm. And um, thanks to the, partly thanks to the work we're doing, she's being listened to. But now she's getting endless calls for meetings. And I said, well, why don't you schedule time for yourself? You know, time to get away from the computer, time to take a walk or sit in the garden. And she said, yeah, but, you know, then someone asked for a meeting during that time and I fill that up. Mm -hmm. and so she said, I know I shouldn't, I shouldn't. But then she's all stressed about it. And what we, or, what we, what we figured out is she could talk to her admin. Her admin builds in the breaks for her. And then she fills them herself. So I said, why don't you ask your admin to be like, like a, a double opt-in, if you will. And if you 
book a cal uh, book an appointment during that or accept an appointment request have your admin say are you sure do you really want to do this and get you out of the automatic yes of course i'll do that and she said oh yeah and you know i don't have to be at all those meetings or the really important ones could be scheduled at a different time i could say that i'm not available but she was afraid mm -hmm. that uh, especially as a woman yep. her her immediate superior uh, the person who's two levels above her understands but her immediate superior has no children Mm -hmm. has you know has a wife who takes care of him so he has nothing to worry about around the the house and he calls he says she's shirking she's lazy because she's taking time off and she had to learn to say no you know mm -hmm. it's not that it's just one person and that's the other thing it was just one person was right. complaining everybody else understood and that's really working. She's making yeah. a big difference. So that, let's kind of expand that out because I think it's a really great example of really kind of figuring out what's your level of risk tolerance. Yes. Okay. And what are the consequences when you create a boundary? Mm -hmm. Right. So it's always about what I, what I always kind of want people to look at is what's the consequence if I do it this way? Mm -hmm. What's the consequence if I do it that way? Can I tolerate the consequence? Mm -hmm. So here she is. She's, you know, feeling number one, you're making her aware of how she's sabotaging herself. That's number yes. one. Yes. Right. And number two is really looking at her thinking of how she's got this figured. I have to take this thing because XYZ is going to say that I'm, I'm lazy. Mm -hmm. That's her reality. That's what she's dealing with. So then we play it out. Okay. So what happens if I say no? And he says that I'm lazy. Can I tolerate that comment? Mm -hmm. Is my job at risk? Really? Yeah. yeah. Okay. What's the risk? Yeah. If I speak up. When you work overtime and you're working extra hours on other days, that is not recognized. Mm -hmm. It's just the time that you say no mm -hmm. that it pays attention. That's right. That's right. So really, Elizabeth, what we're really talking about, you know, kind of in, in this deeper level is how do I value me? Ah, yes. You know, and what am I willing to put myself on the line for? because I am important. My mental health is important. Okay. If I'm not mentally healthy, I'm not going to be able to produce, you know, even in the best of times, the days that are lost between anxiety and depression mm -hmm. is astronomical. Oh yeah. Astronomical in terms of the bottom line, in terms of employee retention, employee happiness, all of that, you know, well, and also the hours lost by the lying there in the middle of the night saying, what if, what if I say no, and there are terrible consequences? And I don't know about you, but you know, I have been known before I met you, <laughs> I have been known to spin all the horrible scenarios to the point where I'm afraid to ask a question or ask for help. And, and it's all in my head. Please so, tell me, Tina, please tell me I'm not the only person who does Oh this. my goodness, no. <laughs> so as you know, Elizabeth, with my whole program, The Mastery Under Pressure, one of the things that I talk about is do your thoughts produce something useful for you? Ah. So we start to become, when I said to you, you're making this young this woman aware, awareness is everything. Now we, we call it mindfulness. Mindfulness, mm -hmm. being aware in the present moment without judgment. Mm -hmm. So I'm noticing that I keep going into these what if scenarios. Mm -hmm. Does that take my take me to a useful place? Does that produce something positive and useful for me? Mm -hmm. and if the answer is no, then I have to learn how to turn my sentences around and look at them. So what if I do this? Mm -hmm rather than the what if. So what if I do this? What yeah. are the consequences? 
Ah, okay. I like that. Yeah. Right. So then we bring ourselves back to the reality. You see how many times I go back to, okay, what's true in this moment? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then I, you know, I train myself to operate from this moment because what our habit is as humans, we either live in the past Mm -hmm. or we live in fear of the future. Yeah. Yeah. And so that takes away our power of the present moment. That's really what empowerment is really about. Empowerment means being at choice. I choose my behavior. I choose my actions. I choose my words. And in high stakes, high pressured environments, we want to train ourselves to be able to have these things pop up for us. That's why Mm -hmm. it's training. Oh, yeah. Yeah. over and over and over and over and over again, just like the great athletes train over and over Mm -hmm. and over again. So these tools are right at our fingertips. Yeah. One of the things that Nancy realized was that she's, she was obsessing over one, one person's nasty remarks, Mm -hmm. who's a nasty person anyway. And, uh, and ignoring the 99% who think she's amazing. Yes. Yeah, the whole rest of her team is, is amazing. And the other thing that came out of that was that her admin was empowered. Her, you know, the woman who was administrative assistant to her is now important, more important because she is a, a gatekeeper who's truly being a gatekeeper to protect. Yes. to protect the leader of the team so the leader of the team can do can do the important work that she's doing the reason why she's the leader of that team you were going to tell a story so this is one that's working mm-hmm. you were going to tell a story about someone who's not able to do that and how do we how do we do it when it really is too dangerous okay to say no so i have a client that um, is, is, is here without papers, many years. Okay, so that's always something that she's had to deal with. Mm-hmm. However, now with the situation of jobs not easily being available and her not having you know, an easy way to move from one job to another, she's in a job with, that is extremely, extremely toxic. She's got a crazy boss just crazy, nasty boss. And, and I say to her the same thing. It's like, okay, so let's put it in the reality. Okay, so you've got some real challenges that maybe not other people don't even have that you have. And at the same time, let's look at the consequences. If you quit, can you pay your rent? Do you have food on the table? Food on the table, roof over our head, A number one, survival mode she cannot afford to quit the job okay but so then we look at what can you do while you're tolerating this job you're you knowing that right now you can't quit because the consequences are too great Mm -hmm. let's talk about what you can do in terms of your all your other abilities that you can begin to start to look at either another job getting hired or starting your own business. Mm-hmm. She's just amazing. She's just a very entrepreneurial, amazing organizer. She's got an organized, I mean, she's just, just lots of gifts and talents. So we wanna spend a lot of time looking at the gifts and talents mm-hmm. and starting to create a business where she's not you know, under somebody else's nose and thumb. Mm-hmm. And even though time is short and she's exhausted and she's tired, that becomes a greater need for her to put into building something out so that she can let go of this job. Wow. Okay. So there's, yeah, there's, so what can you control? It goes back to that. That's right. That's exactly right. And the perceived lack of control. Or lack of control that you think. So when she, she'll, you know, she'll text me or she'll call me and she'll, um, you know, you know, want my empathy and I give her my empathy for it, but I, I can't just kind of say, you know, yeah, 
just quit and everything will be great because that's not real for her. Mm -hmm. and that's right. what a lot of these essential workers and people that are put into these situations that are um, so, so, so difficult. It's like we as a community, how can we support them? Yeah. You know, how can we, how can we do the things that will be, I just saw an, um, something yesterday in, in the San Francisco times about um, paying your server, you know, giving them extra tip money. Right. You know, they are, they're putting themselves at risk. You know, you're just one person that's coming to sit down. They've got, you know, maybe 10, 15, 20, a hundred people that are coming in a day that they're becoming in contact with. Let's support them. Mm -hmm. you know, let's do things that, that we can. And so that we get, you know, there's something else I saw yesterday in terms of community of, of just really, really kind of helping each other out. Oh, this was yeah. in Lebanon. Lebanon. Oh yeah, yeah. That the young people are out there with, with brooms and, and coming in and cleaning out, you know, people's homes. And, um, you know, we as Americans are very, very individualistic. Mm -hmm. And um, it's sort of the good news, bad news. Mm -hmm. It gives us lots of freedom, but it also separates us. Yes. Yeah. Well, and also, you know, there are cultures where it's all about the family and the people around you and your community. And, and, and sometimes if you're living in situations where things are difficult, you become a community in order to, uh, in order to, to survive. You know, I think of my, my friends who are healthcare workers and the community feeling that they, that they have of being the people who are trying, trying to make hospitals work and trying to help patients. And they're not, and they're not all treating COVID patients, but they're trying to treating the people who are shoved aside because the emergencies come in and what do you do and how do you handle that? And there's immense community feeling there, which, you know, it, it is part of the, thank God, it's part of the natural response to the crisis. Yeah. It's actually one of the challenges that we're having now in um, America, at least, is people banded together in the beginning of the shutdown. And, you know, we're for, for two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, people were very into, yes, we'll get through it. And now that it looks like it's going to be going for months, mm -hmm. we have to adjust. Yes, we do. Yeah. So it's not necessarily a crisis response. You know, it's not a sprint. It's a marathon now. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And, and so the way that um, I can share the way that I've been dealing with it. Please. Because, um, I think the guidelines uh, in terms of wearing your mask and, and keeping your distance and following the things that they're asking us to do, um, I can't say it 100% because I don't think it's 100%, but it works. Mm -hmm. It works. And you know, we just took a trip, a, a, a car trip to Denver from San Francisco and you know, with our masks and our wipes and you know, eating outside and staying in places that were um, B&Bs or Airbnbs that were more tightly controlled. And um, we had a fabulous trip. We had a fabulous trip, you know? And so it's, you can't, in my opinion, this is so much just my opinion, I can't be a prisoner forever. Yeah. And so uh, we have learned to accommodate within the guidelines that we can. Yeah. Yeah. Walk, wearing a mask, doing those things. And again, this is the way it is until it isn't. Right, right. And, and there are the people who are rebelling. I know. And I just saw a headline yesterday about um, illegal parties in Europe mm -hmm. and parties that are moving around and people are saying to hell with it. I'm going to, I'm going to party. I'm going to be together. I'm not going to wear a mask. And places where that happens, then the infection rate goes up. So I, I think the biggest message of what we started with Elizabeth yes. in terms of what's in my control, what's out of my control. You know, it's yes. really, really, really the theme. And there's a wonderful saying that I heard from um, Crystal Hansen. I know you just uh -huh. did an interview with Mark Victor Hansen. And, and she said, life is created on the inside. Mm. I just love that. Life is created on the inside. Great. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Well, Tina Greenbaum, thank you so much for being my guest today. 
And I'm really, I'm delighted to have you. For those of you who are interested in learning more, I will be posting Tina's, uh, Tina's contact info here. And you can also find out about me at uh, elizabethbachman.com. You can find out about the podcast at uh, speakers who get results at any podcast player you may have. So Tina Greenbaum, my friend, I'm sure I'll have you back. You're one of my regular go-to people. So thank you so much for joining me today. Elizabeth, and thanks for the good work that you're doing. Awesome.